Good morning to all of you. A warm welcome to our Zoom webinar organized by GMOA and Society for Health Research and Innovation. Today's topic is a timely and appropriate lecture for the primary healthcare professionals of the present day. And the topic is identification of dengue at OPD and ET setup during COVID-19 pandemic. Kindly mute your microphone and turn off the camera during the presentation and use the chat box to clear your doubts at the end of the session. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anand Vijay Vikrama, Senior Consultant and a renowned physician, National Institute, Institute of Infectious Diseases. Thank you for joining us sir, today, um, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for selecting this topic. Uh, uh, as you said, that this uh, important time because uh, we are encountering problems with COVID as well as dengue at present. So I'll be mostly focusing on uh, dengue uh, because uh, we have been dealing with COVID for the last uh, one and a half years, and I'm, I'm sure most of you are uh, quite thorough in uh, what we are doing in in COVID. Uh, but what I, what I see over the last couple of weeks is that uh, a lot of people seem to have forgotten dengue, or rather management of dengue. So therefore it is, uh, as I said, it is very timely that the GMO has selected this topic. Dengue was uh, first diagnosed in Sri Lanka in 1962. Uh, that was the serologically confirmed diagnosis. And since uh, then we have been having few cases. And uh, uh, what was called a major epidemic was reported in 1989, even though we call it a major epidemic, uh, that was a few hundreds of cases. And then uh, it was endemic since uh, 1989. And uh, since 2000, year 2000, there were over 40,000 cases annually, and there were cyclical epidemics every once in every two to three years. We have been seeing uh, epidemics in the country until 2009. In 2009, so you can see how the, the dengue spread occurred across the years. Uh, it was more mostly in the, the Western province, and then from there it spread by 2010. It was involving the whole country except a little part in the hilly area. This is how it spread. We see a small hundred, few hundreds of cases, and then few thousands of cases until 2009, when we had a large outbreak with 35,000 cases where 350 people died. And since then, we have been having more than uh, 25, 30,000 cases every year. And in 2017, we had a large outbreak with 186,000 cases reported with 440 plus deaths uh, recorded in that year due to dengue. And uh, even after that, I don't have the, uh, the most recent slide. But uh, over the last two years, too, we have been seeing more than 25,000 cases. With this increasing number of cases, we saw a change in its demography also. Uh, when we were medical students in the 80s, we learned dengue in pediatric. So in 19, even in 1996, you can see 70% uh, of cases were less than 15 years of age. But this was changing. By 2006, you can see more and more uh, teens and adults are getting infected. And by 2012, uh, more than 70% of cases were above 15 years of age. And of this, 50% of cases were between the 15 years to 50 years of age. This has been reported in uh, other countries too, especially in Asian countries, in like in, in Thailand, India, uh, Indonesia. Uh, and uh, with that, we saw some changes in the complications which developed uh, with them. There was a more, since we had a relatively high mortal rate in 2001, no, no, 2009, uh, some of these deaths were reviewed by an expert from Thailand. And then, as Professor Siripin, what she found was 50% of deaths were due to overloading and 50% of deaths were due to prolonged shock. In other words, 50% of patients had too much of fluid, then 50% did not have enough fluid. This is basically a problem of fluid management. 
when we come to COVID, I prepared this slide uh, about maybe about three weeks ago. Oh, these are world numbers, but now this is much more than this. You can see how the COVID had been going on with the uh, daily case reported number of uh, more than uh, 75,000 cases, uh, sorry, uh, 700,000 cases uh, throughout the last one year or so. When you come to Sri Lankan situation, as of yesterday, we had 283,000 cases reported, that is since uh, January last year, with uh, 373 uh, deaths. For this year, we have had up to now, we have had 15,000 dengue cases, that is uh, till 30th of June. And uh, for June alone, we have had 2,997 cases. When you look at these figures, we know all these are underreported. There are many asymptomatic cases, and as well as uh, both in COVID as well as in, in dengue. And also in dengue, what we see in these days is a lot of people come late to hospital because uh, they are frightened of uh, into hospitals, or even when they go to seek medical attention. Uh, they are asked to get, uh, they, are, they are given uh, outpatient like treatment without uh, probably thinking of dengue. It seems that uh, we have uh, a lot of our doctors and patients as well have uh, forgotten that dengue has become endemic, dengue is endemic in Sri Lanka. So, with this, we see other issues also because of the fear generated by the rapid spread or high number of high frequency of spread of uh, covid as well as high number of deaths uh, health workers have become more conformist and as have taken a lot of precautions initially without the knowledge but some of these continued after we get, got enough knowledge however when it comes to COVID in this present situation, the first priority has to be the safety of healthcare workers. Because if healthcare workers are affected, then we cannot run the health services. So this is a different situation to our usual situation where the patient becomes priority. Here the priority becomes the priority is the safety of the healthcare workers. However, once the safety is assured, we have to give appropriate care and treatment both to COVID positive patients as well as to COVID negative patients. This is a very important thing. I think we have to, we have to remember and realize at every setting in the healthcare system, whether it is uh, general practice, whether it is outpatient treatment, whether it is ETU treatment, or whether it is uh, inward treatment, we have to, uh, I, I believe we have to keep all these things uh, in mind we have to ensure that we are safe and then we have to provide necessary care, appropriate care and treatment to these patients. When it comes, especially when it comes to COVID, uh, dengue, this causes problems. Because often we see the OPD consultations are done uh, just verbally without examining the patients. Uh, sometimes, across a partition so this is the these are the sad situations we have come across this uh, due to this undue fear and uh, in the wards sometimes the patients are not attended until the rapid test results are available or sometimes the pcr results are available the patients are uh, not looked after well maybe they can have some some sort of treatment but not attended fully so these are the issues which can cause a lot of problems. When we look at uh, the protection with the PP, this one of the uh, health staff person in our hospital wearing a full PP. Uh, and uh, then here, one nurse is, you can see one nurse wearing full PP, taking blood from a patient. Uh, in fact, this, uh, this personal protective equipments were designed not for COVID. 
these were designed for Ebola. Because of the fear we had, we used that in total. However, now we realize some parts of this kit is not necessary. Actually, it's in the process of reviewing these things. Still, probably in an enclosed space. Uh, yeah, so, but in an enclosed space like this, this uh, uh, photo from our ICU, uh, we are in an enclosed uh, air conditioned space where people handle uh, these COVID patients closely. Probably you need, uh, it's, it's probably reasonable to take a uh, lot of precautions. However, in the setup, whatever the setup, we can, with necessary PEP, we can do, give the necessary care, proper care to these patients. This is a patient, COVID patient, who had a big pleural effusion. Uh, this is me, I was aspirating the pleural effusion. You can see the pleural fluid. She had, she had about uh, 1,500 ml aspirated. So we can do, while taking necessary precautions, we can attend to these patients. Uh, so therefore, it is important to give necessary care to these dengue patients uh, because a delay in treating these patients can have a lot of problems. I'm going to highlight some of these with some case histories. I thought I would not limit this to OPDs and ETUs, but ETU because ETU also sometimes you get patients coming in shock. So basically, I thought of uh, discussing about the uh, some key points of management of dengue, highlighting uh, the problems you can encounter using some uh, real world uh, case scenarios. This patient came to our OPD with the history of one day fever. Uh, that was uh, at the peak of dengue time. Now, also, we see a lot of uh, cases reported from uh, uh, in and around Colombo. Uh, so, this patient was stable clinically. The OPD doctor advised him to take adequate fluid, to take paracetamol, and to have rest and uh, discharge the patient. Now, is this correct? Does he need any investigation? Now, sometimes people do investigations, though in a, in a day one patient, this is not necessary. Now, in this patient, they did some investigation. The white blood cell count showed uh, 4,300 white cells with 76% neutrophils, TRP24, dengue antigen was negative. Now, the question is, could this still be dengue? In an endemic situation where we are, we have to consider the possibility of dengue still in this patient, even though the dengue antigen is negative. Dengue antigen has a sensitivity of uh, wide range, about 60 to 75 percent. Even though the positive antigen almost always suggests dengue, uh, negative antigen test will not exclude dengue. That is the important thing we have to realize. If, the, if you are doing the antigen, better to do it within first 72 hours of the onset of from the onset of fever, where the chances of detecting is high. Still, the positivity rate is varying from 70 to 80 percent, uh, and maybe even less. So, therefore, do not exclude dengue by a negative antigen test. If it is positive, it can be positive in some other. Uh, flavor viral infections which are not prevalent in Sri Lanka. So, therefore, in practical sense, if it is positive, then it is dengue. And in uh, dengue, typically we see this pattern if the counts are done on uh, flu, blood counts are done on the first uh, uh, day or two, you see a normal white cell count, a low normal white cell count, and the neutrophil towards the high side, that it could be normal, CRP may be a little high. This is the typical pattern we see in a dengue patient if you do a blood count on day one or two. So if they are, if you are sending them, of course, you can send them on uh, fever with day one or two situation. Uh, we have to, for an adult general, we advise to take about 200, uh, two and a half liters of liquids, liquids with so, uh, solutes, and they have to have adequate physical rest. 
and it is important that they should not take anything other than paracetamol for the fever or body aches and pain. All NSAIDs and steroids should be avoided. They can have, if they are symptomatic, they can have anti so and H2 receptor blockers, and they need to be reviewed daily with full blood counts, at least from a third day of illness. It's important to do a full blood, it's not essential to do a full blood count on day one, but uh, in patients with other comorbidities and pregnant mothers, it's important to do a blood count on day one to have a baseline figures. So this patient comes back on third day with the full blood count, still febrile, third nausea, the white stable. Now the white count shows the reduction of WBC, plate is still within the normal range, but it's going down. So again, still he, he doesn't need admission. We can still wait and see. Now, next day he comes with a plated count of 110,000, and then we have to admit. So, the plated count, if the plated count comes to close to 100,000, generally when it is around 120, 130,000, we admit these patients because when it goes below 100,000, patients can develop complications. Not everybody develops complications, but some develop complications. What we saw during the period of 2017 and 18, about 25% of admitted people. Uh, were getting dengue hemorrhagic fever in Colombo. In other some other parts of the country, it was much less, probably because uh, in Colombo we had a uh, much more high rate of secondary. <laughs> so these are the criteria we use for admi admission. If the plated count dropping close to hundred thousand, don't wait till it goes below hundred thousand. Admit it when it gets close to hundred thousand. I have seen some patients coming seen by general practitioners or, or our our. OPD doctors, uh, sometimes when the count is around 95,000 or 90,000, they were asked to get another count next day to see. That is a very risky thing. If it is close to 100, always admit these patients because they need monitoring. Not everybody gets problems, but some get problems and some can uh, die of a delay. It is very important at the OPD setting to identify these patients and admit them at the correct time. In addition to the plated count, if they have abdominal pain, tenderness, persistent vomiting, uh, clinically, if you think there's uh, effusion ositis, bleeding, especially in children, if they're lethargic or restless, and if the liver is enlarged, tender, uh, then they need to get it. Then there are other risk categories we consider, like uh, pregnant mothers, elderly, obese patients with other comorbidities in, and then there may be adverse social circumstances which warrants early admission. In these patients, we have to consider early admission. So once the patient is admitted, we monitor the full blood count and the hematocrit. It is important to get the full blood count, especially the hematocrit, on admission. So therefore, in the ETU, uh, in the OPD setup, it's good to get a blood count and review the, these patients and to decide whether they need admission or not. And if, it, if the counts are okay, if the patient's stable, they can go home and come back next day uh, to get another count and review. So you can time the admission. Not all fever patients need admission. And uh, once they are admitted, the idea is to prevent shock. If they're going into, if they, to detect if they're leaking fluid or going into DHF, prevent shock, in, even if they go into shock, some, some patients while in hospitals can go into shock, even if they go into shock, if we detect it early, then we can save this patient. So once they're admitted, we give uh, maintenance fluid, about 2 ml per kg, maximum of 2.5 liters for an adult. It can, depending on the patient, you can give it either oral or intravenous or both. If they have vomiting or loose motion, you give additional fluid to replace, and it's the symptomatic treatment we give. There are two guidelines. Uh, one is the WHO guideline, which is popularly called TDR guideline. Uh, and the second one is the where the dengue is classified into dengue without warning signs, dengue with warning signs, and severe dengue. And then this is the guideline by the CRO group of uh, in the WHO, where the dengue is classified into symptomatic dengue is classified into undifferentiated fever, dengue fever, hemorrhagic fever, and expanded dengue syndrome. Uh, we use this classification because we find this uh, more user-friendly and uh, applicable to the, the clinical setup and the management setup. Uh, and the, these are the things we see mostly, the dengue fever and dengue hemorrhagic fever. It is the dengue hemorrhagic fever which tend to cause problems because they have plasma leakage. However, dengue fever patients also, some of them can have unusual hemorrhage. 
rarely you get other expand which is called the expanded Lenny syndrome which is lesser rare so these are the guidelines we use at the moment at the moment we are in the process of revising the, the guideline on adults in dengue fever you have a febrile phase which tend to go on for about uh, most of the time fever tend to go on for about five days and then it settles and then they have a conv convulsion period and in uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever in between the febrile phase and the convalescent phase there's another phase which is called the critical phase yeah there is plasma leakage generally this lasts for 48 hours this is how the blood counts behave the white count goes the total white count goes down goes down for about five days and then starts to go up with that the lymphocyte count which is low initially goes up and then it actually it exceeds the neutrophil percentage and often it the ratio is reversed and we see by this time we see a new lymphocyte percentage of about the, sometimes 80 85 percent even and then the it's again the uh, the neutrophil uh, lymphocyte ratio reverses the platelets again tend to go down and reaches generally goes to a, uh, the lowest level around day six and then it starts to go up if they are leaking these are the period where they leak maximally where you notice the leak with generally with the rise in the hematopoiesis. so the diagnosis of dengue is uh, of dhf is using vital parameters you urine output you look for uh, clinical evidence of plasma leakage like development of pleural effusion or ascites then hematological findings are important the blood count pcv and ultrasound is useful to detect fluid generally leaking occurs when the platelet count goes below 100000 but uh, the platelet count below 100000 does not always mean dhf this little gadget the microhematocrit uh, machine is very useful in this in the management of dengue in fact what i would say is if you don't have uh, this in your ward uh, you are not uh, uh, suitable to manage your ward is not, not suitable to manage the uh, dengue patient the same in the etu also so this is not an expensive thing this was about 100000 rupees uh, the important thing is you get quick results with that within five minutes you get the pcv if you are not sure you can always repeat it so it's a reproducible thing and it can be done by nurses and everybody should know how to do it. this doctors nurses everybody should know how to use this it's a very important little tool in the management for the management of things so the the treatment is entirely supportive if there are problems if we detect it early if we attend to that with good monitoring and appropriate volume replacement then uh, these patients recover very well in, a, in an uneventful manner plasma leakage i said uh, which occurs in uh, dhf that is the, the whole mark of dhf occurs uh, not in a uniform manner generally it tend to go up and then go down uh, generally it tend to go to a peak during the middle of the critical phase which usually lasts for about 48 hours and uh, uh, the amount of degree of leakage vary from person to person. Some people have little leak, and uh, so nothing happens. Uh, so a lot of them recover, and people sometimes tend to mistake this, uh, thinking that patients recovered because of their treatment. No, they recover on their own, uh, especially if their leak is little. If the leak is high, then, of course, there can be problems. So it's not a uniform leak, gradually increases, reaches a peak. If a critical volume is lost from the intravascular compartment, then the patient goes into shock. If shock persists for several hours, multi-organ failure will set in. So during this leakage phase, we try to manipulate fluid to maintain the effective circulation. We give, we try to give the sufficient amount to maintain the effective circulation if you do too much of fluid the patient the leak will be more if you do too little then uh, the patient will go into shock so the calculation those things are in the guideline uh, this is how the leak occurs and we try to adjust the fluid accordingly so we don't give uh, fluid in a flat rate we give fluid increase the fluid gradually and then goes down 
occasionally we might have to go to a high level of about 7 ml per kg, but that's not uh, common. Very, very occasionally we have to do that. Generally, they will need about uh, 3 ml, 4 ml per kilogram. Uh, that is about uh, uh, 150, 200 ml for an adult per hour fluid for few hours during this critical phase, and then we can come down in most of these patients. Uh, now, the day before yesterday, I got a call from a senior registrar about uh, a doctor who is having dengue. He had detected leak, uh, leaking and the, the output has gone down, urine output has gone down. So I, was, I asked how much fluid you are giving. Uh, after detecting the fluid, we reduced the intake to 90 ml power. Actually, I got very angry because that was totally against the basics of the uh, dengue management. When we detect leaking, that means the intravascular compartment is the, the volume of the intravascular compartment is reducing. So we have to increase the intake. There's no point in if you reduce the fluid, the leak will continue, the patient will go into shock. So when we detect fluid, we have to increase the fluid, not a lot, hmm? increase the fluid gradually. That is why we say it, we try to match the leak. It's not always possible, but that is what we right so increase the fluid a little bit if you are if the patient is getting 2 ml per kg or 100 ml per hour you increase it to 150 ml per hour and give it for a few hours and assess the patient again and these patients needs to be assessed regularly if they are in shock this is a, this slide shown to us in thailand they say if the patient is untreated for 10 hours they die Four hours untreated, 50% going to liver failure, and uh, sorry, they're going to liver failure, and 50% is the survival. If they're in renal failure and liver failure, the survival goes down to 10%. And they say if there's three organ failure, the survival is a miracle. Well, we have achieved this miracle at some point, but it's, it's difficult. In, uh, however, if they are in shock, they have to be, uh, they have to be treated urgently. Now, this patient, again, a patient who came to our hospital. Uh, he came with a fever, history of fever for five days duration, nausea and vomiting, dizziness, reduced urine output, no bleeding manifestation. He had a blood count done on day three. He had come to the OPD, our OPD, this happened uh, three, four years ago, uh, our OPD and a blood count done on uh, day three, platelet count was 138. For some reason, he was not admitted and he was asked to come next day. So he came to the next day gave a blood sample and after a couple of hours he was told the sample is clotted so he went home even though he was feeling dizzy and on fifth day when he came at the opd his blood pressure was 70 by 60 he was in shock was 115 in the etu blood pressure is 100 by 80 these are, these are the supine blood pressure these are seated blood pressure so you have to appreciate the difference and uh, these tachycardic so capillary refill is prolonged, periphery is cold, lungs uh, bilateral ion reduced, tenderite hypochondrium. In ETU, this patient is dengue, in dengue shock syndrome. This is an emergency. We can't, now patient came in shock. He would have been in shock for a couple of hours at home. So the, such patients should be treated immediately. It's important to, put, to cannulate, we give a fluid bolus. For an adult, we give 500 ml over one hour uh, oxygen. We monitor pa patients frequently. Then uh, get ready for blood transfusion. They might, because when they are in shock, a lot of people tend to bleed. They might need blood transfusions. Keep that ready. Uh, before and after fluid boluses, you do in what PCV. So in the ETU, you do a PCV. You don't wait for the the uh, blood count or count for the come from the lab, because you have the count done on previous day. You know the PCV, and uh, so it is without a blood count. Now you know the PCV on this one, it's uh, 43 uh, on day three. So you know the baseline. So when it comes to the ETU, uh, you don't have to wait for the blood count. You just do a PCV and treat the patient. So in what PCV done on admission, that's at the ETU as 55. From 43, it has gone up to 55. That's, uh, that's about. Uh, about 27% rise of the PCV, which means a lot of fluid has leaked. 
you know, plasma has leaked. That is why the hemo, there is hemo concentration, so much of hemo concentration. And when you got the count, you see that platelets has gone down to 20,000. When they come in shock, we assume that they are in the middle of the critical phase. So they have the maximum leak. This may be 24 hours, maybe 30 hours, maybe 20 hours. So somewhere around the middle generally, or maybe towards the latter part of the critical phase. So we calculate the fluid quota, and then we give a bolus. After the first bolus, the PC had come down from 55 to 51. The RFT is better now. Blood pressure is better. So then we gradually uh, reduce the fluid. So for the next hour, we gave we are given 350 ml, and now the patient has started passing urine. CRFT is improving. So this is how we give fluid. We give a free bolus at the beginning. Then we gradually cut down. Actually, this is probably too fast of cutting down. Probably we have to go little at a little higher level. Little slow cut down should be little slower there. Uh, we resuscitate the patient with crystalloids, with normal saline or Hartman, not with the strand at this point, but later, if they become unstable, then we can give this strand. Now here, patient was given half the strand within, uh, within half an hour. You can see the output which was nil has gradually improved. And this patient needs to be monitored hourly, hourly. Because the, the, these things can change very rapidly and such changes should be detected early. So even if they come in shock, if they are diagnosed early, if they are resuscitated at the ETU without a delay, uh, with close monitoring, the recovery will be good, very good. This patient was discharged three days later. So irrespective of whether we have COVID or not, such patients should be treated as an emergency. So you have to take measures to protect yourself and attend to this patient without a delay. So in shock, we give fluid bolus 10 ml per kg for an adult we give 500 maximum and then gradually cut down the fluid we can cut maybe 7 7 ml per hour for two to three hours 5 ml per hour for two to three hours like that we gradually reduce reduce the intake if the hematocrit is low we have to transfuse blood we will, we will look into that this boy was transferred with dengue uh, If necessary, we give at some points, we give uh, Dexan, which is the uh, preferred colloid used in uh, DHF. Then we give Dexan, we give it as a bolus, either 500 ml over one hour or 250 ml. These are adult doses, 250 ml over half an hour. Uh, not as slow infusion during the critical phase. There are occasions later we can give, but not during the uh, leaking phase. And it should not be, it should be given to well hydrated patients. Bleeding is another common complication in dengue. We have to suspect this on admission itself. It can occur both in dengue fever and dengue fever. In children, bleeding mostly mostly occur when they are in shock. But in adults, even if they are not in shock, bleeding is common. Uh, it can be due to external factors like trauma, in the cells, intrinsic factors, or prolonged shock. Multiple factors are due to the uh, now, unfortunate thing is, in spite of advocating not to give NSAIDs or steroids often to dengue patients, still people give NSAIDs. This is one of the prescription, other Unavedana, right? This is another prescription given for dengue patients. You can see another one, diclofenac sodium. This uh, another prescription. So, th this is still a, pra a practice. And in addition to this, some people have started using dexamethasone. Now, when it comes to uh, COVID, again, some people are, have started using dexamethasone. In a nutshell, the message I want to tell you is in India, this large number of deaths, one of the reasons for the large number of these deaths were attributed to abuse of steroids. Do not give dexamethasone to COVID patients or, for that matter, for any patient with fever. COVID patients, the dexamethasone is indicated only if they are hypoxic. There had been a very good trial, a large trial, and the trial showed that it is efficacious only in hypoxic patients, and it is not efficacious in uh, patients who are not hypoxic. 
that that category also has been evaluated and is documented based on evidence that it is not effective it can be harmed so don't give steroids unnecessarily don't give steroids to patients uh, covid patients or for that matter uh, and dengue patients now this 17 year old girl admitted to a base hospital this uh, this again a real case admitted a couple of uh, years ago or uh, in an afternoon with uh, typical features of dengue so these features are enough to diagnose dengue on examination she was afebrile looking uh, otherwise all right table they have done uh, dengue antibody and full blood count on admission now if a, when a dengue patient comes on around third fourth day or fifth day if they are afebrile then that is the period where you have to be very cautious see the period where they they are likely to leak if they are leak when they are afebrile not that does not mean they cannot leak in febrile phase of with fever but uh, mostly they when they leak uh, that starts when they are becoming afebrile so if somebody comes with afebrile this thing and if they are not feeling well then you have to be very cautious in handling that patient this day morning she was found to be in shock the full blood count which was done on admission showed pcv of 40 and platelet of 70000 unfortunately this count was available even though the blood was sent from the etu this count was available for the ward staff to see only on next day morning so the patient even though the dengue was suspected the patient was not monitored until she was found to be in shock at 8 a.m in the morning so in the ETU, if you suspect dengue, if you suspect problems, when you send the send the blood count, make sure that you get the count. Otherwise, no point of sending an urgent blood count if you are getting it next day. If you are seeing it next day morning, there, there's no point. When they found that the patient is seen uh, in shock, another count was sent, and that count showed the rate out of 44,000 and the PCV of 40. You can appreciate that there had been no change in the PCV. An ultrasound was done which showed evidence of leaking. Now, when the plasma leaks out, we expect the PCV to go up. However, there's no PCV rise. That means, in addition to leaking, there's bleeding also. So, uh, this is how the critical, uh, the chart was managed these were the patient was found to be in shock the fluid bolus was given quite rightly and then unfortunately the patient was sent to the radiology department for an ultrasound scan where the, for this one hour she did not have fluid and then the fluid was very rapidly cut down to 75 m so initially the blood pressure improved urine output was okay and you can see the output was going down now we i said there is bleeding because there was no pcv rise that was realized only later but was given later but that was too late so the patient was not monitored until shock shock with low blood pressure low pcv that means there is bleeding uh, after shock for one hour patient did not have fluid there was rapid reduction blood was late and slow and the output was going down next day the patient was transferred to us unfortunately she was in multi-organ failure at that time and we could not save her in spite of trying for level best she died so this is what happens when the patients are not monitored properly when the shock is not detected properly and uh, and when the necessary treatment is not given Blood is needed when there's over bleeding, but often they don't have over bleeding. When there's significant drop of hematocrit within few hours, and if the patient is unstable, or 
even with normal hematopoiesis, if the patient is in shock, if there is worsening metabolic acidosis, refract shock, these are the uh, indications for blood transfusion. However, you have to consider blood transfusion if the, the patient is in shock with small amount of fluid leakage, then the shock, the leaking alone contribute to, uh, cannot be attributed to the shock, then you have to suspect bleeding. If the patient is having low or normal PCV with unstable hemodynamics, you have to suspect bleeding. Before bleeding occurs, or before they go into shock, there will be telltale signs. Their urine output may reduce, the, the CRFT may, prolong, may get prolonged, the, they, they may get tachycardia, uh, and they can have postural dizziness and postural hypotension. Now, all these do not occur in every patient. In one patient, the urine output may be normal, but there may be only tachycardia without fever. In a, another patient, the heart rate may be normal, but the output is going down. So these are the, the no. That's why we have to monitor all these things. If a problem, if there's a problem in one parameter, that means there's a problem to be addressed. Every patients do not behave in the same way. I have seen patients who are in shock while having normal urine output. Now this patient. Uh, this is uh, these slides are made by one of the sectors in the uh, unit of a base hospital. I uh, got it from a presentation. I haven't changed any of this slide. I'm just uh, putting it uh, as it is because they are prepared very nicely, showing what happened exactly. This is a 13 year old boy coming admitted with fever for one day, and uh, he was uh, stable on admission, 29 kilos of weight, uh, normal examination uh, on admission. I think probably there's a mistake here. I, I think the neutrophils has to be 76% at the lymphocyte, probably 14%. Did the count on admission, plated count was 206,000. The RP was a little high. There are few red cells. Few red cells can occur in dengue, in urine, or sometimes a lot of red cells can appear in dengue. Then patient was having a high fever. Uh, this is the temperature chart. Patient was admitted with uh, on the second day. You can see the, the fever was going down here. It's important to remember this point, this point where the fever goes down. So next day, high fever spikes. Uh, table patient was uh, started on uh, IV antibiotics, maybe because the CRP was a little high. Uh, blood counts repeated, dengue antigen was done. And the repeat blood count at 8 a.m., you can see the white count is going down and the platelet is going down. It is repeated next uh, in the afternoon. White count has gone down further now to 103. That was in the afternoon. Now, this is the time the fever was set. Even signs are basically a little high, and NS1 is positive. More red cells. So, dengue fever monitoring was started. Patient was given 60 ml per hour. Usually, we give 2 ml per hour. So, this is the usual correct rate. Uh, and the next day, fever is settling. Uh, output is uh, 0.8 ml per hour and uh, blood pressure stable. Treatment monitoring continued. And now the count. This is 11 name, but this is the morning count, which was done probably around uh, 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock. Data is 41,000 and the PCV is 52. Now the previous PCV is 41, 39. So basically, let's say it's 40. It's so gone to 52. That's a 30% rise of the PCV. If there's a 30% rise of the PCV, you have to suspect shock. If the patient is not on shock, anticipate shock. Because such a patient with such a rise in PCV is very, very likely to go into shock within, within the next couple of hours if they are not already in shock. Because the plasma leakage is so much to have that much of hemoconcentration. Now the liver enzymes are going up. Uh, so the fluid was calculated, which came to about 10, it was divided as an average, came to 65 ml per hour. Uh, now, as I said earlier, the, when there's leaking, fluid has to be increased. Unfortunately, for some reason, instead of increasing fluid, the patient was given 65 ml per hour since the detection of leak. The patient had uh, two loose tools. Now the output is going down. Patient is becoming tachycardic, complaining of right hypochondrial tenderness. Now, all these are... Uh, Signs of problem. 
this is the count where the PCV was 52. And afternoon, the end of the count, patient, this has gone to 57. Afternoon is 54, data is going down. Now the liver enzyme arises. Patient was, uh, was connected to a monitor and next day morning, fever is settling, patient ill looking. Uh, patient was given 1,400 for 12 hours and output is okay and the blood pressure is this. Then the leaking scan was done, which showed uh, because of the UN sign probability price, uh, it was given vitamin K. Next day morning, PCV is 58. Now the AST is 5,000. And then the patient knows ultrasound shows mild to moderate free breathing hypocranial fly about uh, with the plural effusion. So the patient was transferred to another hospital, uh, teaching hospital, which is about uh, which was about uh, 20 kilometers away. Uh, the the consultant who received the patient at the ETU said that when the patient came, the patient was in shock, full blown shock. At the time of transfer, however, this slide says conscious rational blood pressure 90 by 60, tachycardic, uh, abdomen right hypochondrial tenderness. So how was the shock missed here? Of course, these patients can be conscious rational e even when they are in shock. That is uh, another another red herring. So the, the a conscious patient who is talking very rationally does not mean the patient is okay. This is how the, the parameters are. The fever settled here. Patient was given 60 ml, 65 ml, 60 ml fluid. Uh, CRFT was normal initially, pulse pressure normal, output was normal. What was abnormal was the hematopic. You can see how the hematopic rose from here. This where the fever settled. And that is where the, where the plate that crossed 100,000. So that is where special children leaks when it goes, when it crosses 100,000, they start leaking. In adults, it can be any time after less than 100,000. You can see how the hematocrit rose. And this is the, how the liver enzymes set up. When they are in shock, it's not, it, 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 there's a lag period of about 24 hours. So the patient died. They could not resuscitate the patient uh, at the teaching hospital. The simple reason was the patient was monitored very well. You can see from these slides, the patient had been monitored very well. Uh, everything had been documented, the uh, PCV had been done. Uh, however, the rise of PCV had been completely ignored, completely ignored. And that is why the patient died. If you have to address, if the fluid was now here, when there's a PCV rise of uh, 30%, the patient was treated as a shock, then patient would have been saved. But by the time it was sent, after one day, nobody can save such a patient. This is another patient, this is not OPD or ETU setting, but it's a setting from the ward. I think a lot of uh, the, I expect a lot of listeners to this are working in wards too. That's why I thought of highlighting this case. Uh, these again from a teaching hospital. Again, this, this slides, these slides are presented by one of the registrars from my unit, not my slides. So they are as they were uh, presented with fever for four days. This was the old one. 10 years ago, but still that this matters. I don't think these things occur now, but still it's important to understand where people can go wrong so that we can correct ourselves. So the patient came with four days fever, patient was stable, and uh, next day in the evening, patient was febrile and the blood pressure is 90 by 7. So the next slide shows the, the fluid management. Patient was given initially oral fluid. In the evening, Oh, at 6.30, patient was given a normal saline bolus, 500 ml, 350, 250, 150, and 100. And then from 1 o'clock onwards, patient was given 50 ml power. Now, this slide I made, this is how the free dose had been reduced. Now, the patient is, was in shock, so quite rightly, a bolus had been given, but it, the free had been cut down very rapidly. In these patients, the leaking continues. If you cut down free too rapidly, Patients will go into shock again. 
So these are tepra. Now at 6.30, 90 by 60, the previous slide says 90 by 70. And then the patient has no, no recording after that until 4.30 a.m. Again, the pressure is same. So the patient is still in shock because the blood pressure earlier was 130. Now it has come down to 90. Uh, so the patient still like that. So yeah, this here, the bolus source. Given patient would have recovered from shock, but it had been cut down rapidly. And uh, then the patient had gone to shock again. We don't know when. But 6.30 also, it had been like that. And then at 6 30, patient was this sneak, pulse blood pressure unrecordable. Patient was put to the MICU, and uh, my MICU patient arrested, resuscitated, and uh, the patient was given uh, three units of dextran, seven units of blood, they 50, 13 units, pay blood 10 units, uh, then uh, factor seven, uh, various things, but however, this patient failed and patient died. This was presented at the, at the mortality review. So we asked the registrar what happened. So what has happened was well, the house officer has detected the patient. Now these are unit with uh, registering house officers, registrars, SRs, everybody. And uh, the house officer has seen the patient at 6.30 in the evening, detected the shock, given a bolus, wrote down how the fluid should be given till next day morning, and uh, went, to, went to quarters. He didn't see the patient again. Nurses didn't monitor the patient, and this is what happened. So it is important to understand that such patients, this sort of patient should be monitored regularly and frequently. So this management of these patients is, has to be a teamwork. It cannot be done only by doctors. It cannot be done only by nurses. We have to work as a team to manage these patients because they need regular monitoring, frequent monitoring, and frequent intervention, if, especially if they're in shock. When they improve, they have uh, some can have bradycardia, most of them have polyuria, and uh, some have appearance of convulsion rash, and some get itching, especially on palms and soles, and uh, the hematocrit settles, and the white count goes up, and the platelet count goes up. Uh, in one of our seminars, this one of our uh, teachers uh, in our training we had in Thailand, uh, Sujitra. Had a lot of experience in uh, these patients. He said, what she said was, if we recognize the disease early and give proper management, the recovery will be rapid and unfruitful. This is really a predictably treatable disease. If we detect these, monitor them regularly, and do necessary interventions at the correct time, we can prevent these deaths due to them. Whether we are having COVID or not, such patients, these patients should be attended. Thank you. Uh, there's a question in the chat box, how to differentiate uh, dengue and COVID. Now, uh, uh, sometimes uh, or oh, often it can be difficult because uh, the, some features are common, especially the features like severe body aches, uh, fever, those are common features for both. So if they commit that, it is difficult to differentiate uh, from the history. Uh, even some dengue patients can have sore throat even, or a little cough. So it's uh, difficult to differentiate uh, the, the fact that the patient is having cough does not exude dengue, or for that matter, does not uh, confirm COVID. Uh, so therefore, we, we have to do some tests. If, the, if we need admission, of course, we can do a rapid test and see. Uh, so, the, so we can uh, have rapid results, quick results. And uh, generally, it's, uh, it's a reasonably sensitive test, though not 100% sensitive. Uh, one other thing is to do a full blood count and re do regular full blood count. In, uh, in the dengue, most of the time we see uh, gradual reduction of platelet count. And the white count, which is initially high, or uh, rather initially towards the low side, with high percentage of neutrophils, reverses the ratio, neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, which is not seen in COVID. So with, uh, uh, with follow-up blood counts, daily blood counts, we can easily say, by about day three or four, where the dengue patients need admission, whether this is dengue or COVID. And even COVID patients will need admission, not immediately, if at all, around day three or four of the illness, or, or maybe later even. 
CRP can be high in uh, dengue, not very high, generally around 20, 30, that sort of figure. In COVID, mostly we see high CRP, but the normal CRP again does not exclude uh, COVID. So I think the most important thing is to do regular full blood count sensing. If it is, uh, if we see these typical changes of dengue, then we have to consider uh, dengue, uh, not consider, we have to clinically diagnose uh, dengue and treat as well. Thank you, sir, for that explanation, sir. We got a few more queries from participants. Uh, one more question from a participant. Please explain the place of prosimide in convalescent phase of uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever. Uh, in the leaking phase of uh, dengue fever, we all, uh, almost always we try to avoid prosimide. Very occasionally, uh, rarely we give prosimide, that is after giving dextran in the leaking phase. Generally, we avoid prosimide during the leaking phase. Simple reason is, in leaking, there's lots of volume of uh, intravascular volume. If you give frosimide, say if the patient is having low output, if you give frosimide, output will improve. But if you, you will, the, your intravascular volume will be further reduced and the, you are likely to go into shock. So during the critical phase, we try to avoid uh, frosimide. But in the convalescent phase, if you are sure that the leaking phase has uh, stopped, then giving small doses of prosimide can be considered if their uh, output is not adequate. But again, most of the time they have good output. And if the output is adequate, that means there's some problem. And then uh, we, we try to, uh, we have to think what to be done. And generally, uh, they need uh, uh, small boluses of uh, dextra at that time, maybe with or without prosimide. Um, there was another one about using Hartman, yes, instead of uh, normal saline, you can use Hartman for crystalloid, either is acceptable. Detection of uh, leaking is not pure, not only based on, uh, on uh, ultrasound examination. If you detect fluid in ultrasound examination, if you do serial ultrasound, say if you do twice a day ultrasound, yeah. our, our, our SHOs, a lot of our SHOs are trained to do ultrasound and detect fluid in dengue. If you do serial ultrasound and say the morning ultrasound is normal or morning ultrasound shows gold bed of edema and uh, the afternoon ultrasound shows some fluid in the hepatorenal pouch, then you know the leaking would have started maybe about uh, 10 to 12 hours before the uh, detection of fluid. When you detect fluid, that means the, the patient is leaking and leaking has started several hours ago. But if you do a leaking on admission, if you detect leaking on admission, then we don't know when the leaking has started. Then we have to go back to the history to see whether anything would help. If the patient had fever and if the fever has settled, so we can take around that time. Or if the patient had regular blood counts and we, we can, if the PCV has been gradually rising. Uh, so we have to take other factors into account to estimate the time of uh, the leak. Now that's a, that's a guess, guess. That's a guess. So it can vary. Uh, when two people guess, it can vary. It may not be the vary by few hours, but it can't vary by 12 hours. It, it can vary by three, four hours. That's acceptable. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, so one more question, sir. Regarding the Zika fever in Sri Lanka, recently in India, they have found a lot of cases about the Zika fever. So how do you, do we have it in Sri Lanka right now? Or if it is there, how do we differentiate from dengue? Uh, fortunately, we don't have it at the moment. Uh, but uh, there had been a couple of serological positives reported. Uh, that was about, uh, I think, about three years ago. We, we two, three numbers. But uh, fortunately, we don't see it. But we, we, we can have it. We have the vector. Uh, the difference is can be difficult to differentiate because one thing is we don't look for that and we don't test for this. So it will be difficult to detect. And mostly the Zika fever tend to cause uh, problems in pregnancy. So the, the clinical uh, issues are different today. Uh, about the continuing fever, there's a question how to handle the con condition. Uh, if fever continues with leaking, is it only due to secondary or will that happen in dengue itself? If the generally, I said the, the fever 
settles at the end of five days in most of the patients or before that. So uh, if the fever continues more than that, sometimes it can be due to prolonged dengue fever, occasional dengue fever, with dengue fever can prolong even up to about 10 days, but that's not common. And so if it continues for more than five days, yeah, one has to suspect secondary bacterial infection. If there are clinical signs to suggest a secondary bacterial infection, uh, say the patient is having productive cough, or if the patient has having, uh, sometimes they can have abdominal uh, or generalized abdominal tenderness with little uh, rebound tenderness, so it may, may suggest some abdominal infection. So if there's clinical suspicion, one has to do a blood culture and start the patient on antibiotic. Or if there are other, other common reason for continuing fever is the cannula site infection. So look for those things. If there's a clinical suspicion of a secondary infection, then take a blood culture and start antibiotics. Now generally, during the first five days, we don't uh, prescribe, we don't advocate giving antibiotics generally. If there, of course, there can be co-infections. If you suspect of a co-infection with the bacteria, then of course it's uh, reasonable to start antibiotics before within five days, but not uh, generally doesn't need necessary. Thank you, sir. Uh, one more question. Uh, what's the role of calcium gluconate in dengue shock? When to give it and how often can you? Uh, uh, how often? There, is, there are no evidence on that. However, evidence on how how often to give it. However, what we have seen is in most of the patients, in most of the patients who are leaking, especially if they have a significant leak, say moderate uh, effusion, moderate uh, ascites, then they are most of them are hypocalcy. So empirically, we give uh, calcium gluconate about uh, four doses or six doses. And then gen that is during the leaking period, we try to cover with calcium gluconate if the leak is significant. But if the leak is slight, then it is not necessary. If they, they are in shock, I, it's better to give empirically because uh, almost certainly they are calcium nervous uh, What is the pathophysiology of bradycardia? We don't know. May, maybe there's some cardiac involvement in involving the uh, the bundle of his or, or the conducting system. Uh, and also at this point, I would like to mention that uh, there, there can be some cardiac involvement in dengue. But, but that does not change the fluid panic. Sometimes we have seen, if you do a course, some, sometimes we have seen the ejection fraction has become low. Uh, so people have suspected myocarditis, reduced fluid, patient has gone into shock and died due to prolonged shock. So do not reduce fluid. You have your normal fluid management, even though you suspect cardiac involvement in day, due to dengue. What are the treatment options for persistently low platelet counts? If the, as I said, the, most of the time, almost always the platelet count goes up on day seven. Occasionally it might get delayed by a day or so. Uh, so maybe day, if not day seven, day eight, it goes up. If it does not go even by that time, there's a rare condition called hemophagocytic syndrome where in spite of increasing platelet, it tends to continue to drop. And with that, other cell lines also tend to drop. The hemoglobin tend to drop or the white cell count tend to drop. Then we have to suspect hemophagocytic syndrome. You investigate for that and you have to, that's an again uh, emergency, you have to treat that emergency. Uh, high serum ferritin in the latter part of dengue convalescence phase is yes, it's an expected finding. Ferritin is an inflammatory marker as well as CRP. As high CRP does not always mean that it's a bacterial infection. Uh, now, for example, for the, in COVID, sorry, in dengue, it tend to go up to about generally about uh, 20, 30 levels. But I have seen patients where it is high as uh, 80, 90 levels. And uh, I don't give them treatment unless I suspect a secondary bacterial infection or co coexisting bacterial infection. Generally, we expect CRP to go to high levels in bacterial infection. However, if you take COVID, CRP is high, high CRP generally occurs due to inflammation, not due to the bacterial infection. Similarly, ferritin is an uh, uh, inflammatory marker. 
if you do serum ferritin around day four five, their ferritin will be around two three thousand. Not day four five, around day six seven, their ferritin can be in uh, two three thousand. In hemophagocytic syndrome, it goes up to very high levels. It goes up to 30-40,000 levels. So with the, with the 2,000 in ferritin, we don't diagnose hemophagocytic syndrome. But if it goes up to 30-40, yes, then we have to seriously suspect that. So persistent low platelet count, you don't, uh, you have to suspect and then decide. And also, we have seen some patients who's uh, the thrombocytopenia, immune thrombocytopenia specificated following dengue or detected following dengue. Such occasions are there, so they don't need immediate treatment unless it is hemophagocytic cancer. Uh, there's a question when there's a patient in a massive leak, how to manage the fluid quota? Now, generally, we say to give about this uh, 4,600 of fluid for an adult during the critical phase. Now, that is not a must. We don't have to give that exactly, or we don't have to limit it that exactly. It is something around that. If you give a lot of more fluid, the patient will go into overload, fluid overload. If you give too little, then the patient will be will go into shock. So you can play around this. It can be, even though we say 4,600, it can be 5,000. That's okay. It can be 4,300. That is okay. But if you give 3,500 instead of 4,600 to a leaking patient, patient will invariably go into shock. At the same time, if you give uh, 6,000 for a patient who is leaking, patient will go into fluid overload. Uh, so the, these are guidelines you can Play around the, within the guideline without uh, grossly violating it. Uh, I say next one tend to be positive in COVID 19. No, this one does not. But some antibody, COVID antibody results can be cross reactive, but not, not what we use in most of the good places. Uh, what are the changes in management in dengue and COVID co infection in place of steroid antiperviration if hypoxy? Yeah, that's a difficult uh, condition. There is no evidence on that. So we have to decide, uh, we have to take a clinical decision on that. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I think that's all the queries uh, for today. And uh, I would like to thank Dr. Ananda Vijay Vikrama for his excellent presentation on behalf of GMOA Sri Knowledge Academy. And uh, we would like to uh, present a token of appreciation for him as well on behalf of, of GMOA and the Society for Health Research and Innovation. Uh, and also, we would like to thank uh, Dr. Sanjeeva Tenakon, Vice President of GMOA, for coordinating this program today. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, we will be meeting you and uh, handing over the talk and sir. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, so that's the end of the webinar today. Thank you all for your participation. And I'm Dr. Sinta signing off. Thank you. Have a good day.